So this weekend, I was really hoping that the court might put another opinion issuance day on the calendar for cases argued this term, since, as things stand, there have only been about a half dozen issued since October, putting the court seriously behind schedule with only a few months left to wrap things up before they break yet again for summer. But no such luck. For a little perspective, the court has usually decided around 20 argued cases by the end of March. But earlier today, there was one opinion related to orders issued by Justice Jackson, dissenting to the writ of certiorari granted by the court in the Chapman v. Doe abortion case, which I will be reading for you right now. Enjoy. Chapman v. Doe, on petition for writ of certiorari to the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, decided March 20, 2023. The petition for a writ of certiorari is granted. The judgment is vacated, and the case is remanded to the United States Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit, with instructions to dismiss the case as moot. Justice Jackson, dissenting. I am concerned that contemporary practice related to so-called Munsingwear vacators has drifted away from the doctrine's foundational moorings. When a case becomes moot, the losing party is generally deprived of the right to appeal the merits of an adverse decision. In United States v. Munsingwear, 1950, this court observed that sometimes that result might be especially unfair, and thus a request for vacator of the lower court's judgment may be entertained and granted to address the inequity. But the court declined to do so in Munsingwear itself, because the equities did not favor the party requesting that relief, as the party had slept on its rights. Later, this court clarified that this Munsingware vacator remedy is available only in extraordinary or exceptional cases where a party meets the burden of demonstrating equitable entitlement to vacator in an otherwise moot case. Here, the majority has acquiesced to the party's joint request for a Munsingware vacator. This case involves a lawsuit that Respondent Doe filed in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Missouri, invoking Revised Statute Section 1979-42 U.S.C. Section 1983, and alleging that Petitioner Chapman violated the 14th Amendment when she denied Doe access to a judicial bypass for an abortion without parental notification. The Eighth Circuit rejected Chapman's plea for quasi-judicial and qualified immunity, after which this court issued Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, 2022. That decision led the parties to jointly stipulate to dismiss Doe's civil action under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 41A1A2, thereby mooting the case. Doe could only have effectuated a dismissal of her case without a court order if Chapman agreed to the dismissal, and apparently Chapman agreed on the condition that Doe did not object to a request for Munsingware vacator from this court. Whatever the parties might have seen fit to agree to, we have long recognized that the equities generally do not favor Munsingware vacator when the party requesting such relief played a role in rendering the case moot. Chapman contributed to the mootness of this case insofar as she stipulated to its dismissal, and it is not unfair for us to now deprive her of the benefit of this bargain, since this form of relief is discretionary, and Chapman had other viable options including relying on her original request that the court grant a petition for certiorari, 
vacate the Eighth Circuit's judgment and remand in light of Dobbs. Our Ordinary Process for Addressing Intervening Developments in the Law Even more fundamentally, this case presents absolutely no extraordinary circumstances justifying Munsingware relief. The underlying matter was voluntarily dismissed, and Chapman does not contend that she is somehow bound to the judgment below. Thus, no unfairness inures from Chapman's loss of the right to appeal. Indeed, Chapman's only argument in support of vacator is that the Eighth Circuit's opinion was wrongly decided. But mere disagreement with the decision that one seeks to have vacated cannot suffice to warrant equitable relief under Munsingware. In my view, it is crucial that we hold the line and limit the availability of Munsingware vacator to truly exceptional cases. To do otherwise risks considerable damage to first principles of appellate review, since at least three background precepts counsel against indiscriminate vacator of a lower court's judgment. 1. An appellate court generally does not have jurisdiction to review a moot case, much less issue an order awarding relief in the matter. 2. Munsingware vacator is an exception to the statutorily prescribed path for obtaining relief from adverse judgments, namely appeals as of right and certiorari. And 3. Our common law system assumes that judicial decisions are valuable and should not be cast aside lightly, especially because judicial precedents are not merely the property of private litigants, but also belong to the public and legal community as a whole. Injudicious awards of Munsingware vacator can also incentivize gamesmanship, as it, for example, enables parties to disclaim potential mootness before the lower court, and, if unsuccessful on the merits at that stage, argue mootness on appeal to eliminate the adverse decision through vacator. While these core principles warrant an exceedingly cautious approach to Munsingware vacator requests, our recent practices reflect a sharp uptick in the number of vacators awarded. I would not add this far from exceptional case to that growing list. We've come to the end of the opinion. Until next episode, thanks for listening to What SCOTUS Wrote Us.